We are now on part two, history. Chapter four, the nomads. If one of the two sexes is in some way privileged, has some advantage, this one prevails over the other and undertakes to keep it in subjection. It is therefore understandable that man would wish to dominate woman, but what advantage has enabled him to carry out his will? We do not even know whether woman's musculature or her respiratory apparatus under conditions different than those of today were not as well developed as in man. She had hard work to do, and in particular it was she who carried the burdens. This last fact is of doubtful significance. It is likely that if she was assigned this function, it was because a man kept his hands free on the trail in order to defend himself against possible aggressors, animal or human. His role was the more dangerous and the one that demanded more vigor. It appeared, nevertheless, that in many cases the women were strong and tough enough to take part in the warrior's expeditions. In any case, however strong the women were, the bondage of reproduction was a terrible handicap in the struggle against a hostile world. As there was obviously no birth control, and as nature failed to provide women with sterile periods like other mammalian females. In nature, every other mammal has long periods of infertility, whereas human females ovulate every month or so. It makes it very difficult, especially back in hunter-gatherer times, to stay safe and to work and to hunt and things like that, because there was this whole period every you know, three weeks where she was ovulating and could very easily become pregnant. And then there was a week where she was, you know, on her period, and that sucks. The woman who gave birth, therefore, did not know the pride of creation. She felt herself the plaything of obscure forces, and the painful ordeal of childbirth seemed a useless or even troublesome accident. But in any case, giving birth and suckling are not activity. They are natural functions, no project is involved, and that is why woman found in them no reason for a lofty affirmation of her existence. She submitted passively to her biologic fate. The stick and the club with which man armed himself to knock down fruits and to slaughter animals became forthwith instruments for enlarging his grasp upon the world. He did not limit himself to bringing home the fish he caught in the sea. First he had to conquer the watery realm by means of the dugout canoe fashioned from a tree trunk. To get at the riches of the world, he annexed the world itself. In this activity, he put his power to the test. He set up goals and opened up roads towards them. In brief, he found self-realization as an existent. To maintain, he created. He burst out of the present. He opened the future. This is the reason why fishing and hunting expeditions had a sacred character. Their successes were celebrated with festivals and triumphs and therein man gave recognition to his human estate. Today he still manifests this pride when he has built a dam or a skyscraper or an atomic pile. He has worked not merely to conserve the world as given, he has broken through its frontiers, he has laid down the foundations of a new future. To compare, women are passively stuck in the maternal childbirth state due to their biology, whereas man had the ability to venture out, and the things he was doing, hunting and warring, allowed him to explore and create, whereas women were stuck raising children and gathering plants and doing the cooking and whatnot, which doesn't require too much creation and ex exploration, whereas getting outside of the home and the village definitely would. It is not in giving life, but in risking life, that man is raised above the animal. That is why superiority has been accorded in humanity not to the sex that brings forth, but to that which kills. On the biological level, a species is maintained only by creating itself anew, but this creation results only in repeating the same life in more individuals. But man assures the repetition of life while transcending life through existence. By this transcendence, he creates values that deprive pure repetition of all value. In the animal, the freedom and variety of male activities are vain because no project is involved. In serving the species, the human male also remodels the face of the earth, he creates new instruments, he invents, he shapes the future. Man shapes the future, but woman repopulates the future. Without one, you cannot have the other, and yet they're not equal players in that. In truth, women have never set up female values in opposition to male values. It is man who, desirous of maintaining masculine prerogatives, has invented that divergence. Men have presumed to create a feminine domain, the kingdom of life of eminence, only, to, in order, only in order to lock up women therein. But it is regardless of sex that the existence seeks self-justification through transcendence. The very submission of women is proof of that statement. 
What they demand today is to be recognized as existence by the same right as men and not to subordinate existence to life, the human being to its animality. The female, to a greater extent than the male, is the prey of the species, and the human race has always sought to escape its specific destiny. The support of life became for man an activity and a project through the invention of the tool, but in maternity, woman remained closely bound to her body like an animal. That was a very quick chapter. It was only like four pages, I think. Yeah, it was four pages. Um, the next one's a little longer, but now we're, since we're into history, it'll be different. I enjoy history, but not all parts of it. My, I really only like it from about the 1400s on. I don't really care much for ancient society, so the next chapter won't be that interesting. And then we start getting into more recent things and medieval times. So it'll be kind of chill, the next one too.